I'd, I'd like to ask you to welcome um, the panel we have uh, here today. We have, uh, we're going to focus on the use of digital media, um, and I would like us to find a lot of time to involve uh, a lot of the stakeholders in the room who are involved in, in content creation and digital media content creation. Uh, we heard a lot of it yesterday. Uh, there's uh, some great examples from MEPI and others in, in, in the poster presentations. Um, and a number of initiatives yesterday, Digital Green were mentioned, uh, BBC, I know Peter's here from Global Health Media Project, uh, Robert uh, Karen Duff is here from 3D for Medical, so we have a lot of people who can add value to these discussions, uh, and we have a very uh, good panel uh, of experts to, uh, to discuss uh, the use of digital media, which is you know, very much becoming um, recognized as the area that um, it really needs a rapid expansion and development. Uh, I certainly feel passionately about it, and I know in our work in IHEED, um, some of the research work we've done uh, looking at community health worker training programs across sub-Saharan Africa showed a real dearth of the use of multimedia in these programs, uh, despite um, the greater availability, as discussed earlier, of uh, smartphones and, and handheld devices. So we're moving into a more digital age uh, in, the, in terms of how we build blended and uh, online and mobile uh, training programs. Uh, and we very much look forward to hearing uh, people's views on this. So I'd like to introduce our panel. Um, um, closest to me is Ferdas Karas. Um, and Ferdas uh, is a, a great expert in the use of uh, multimedia and animation content creation and runs uh, Chocolate Moose Media. And I'll let him tell you a bit more about his background and his interest uh, next to him. Uh, is Uju, uh, and Uju has been, is the program director at One World UK, which is a, a digital media content NGO uh, focused in education and health, and has worked very extensively across across Africa and the other continents. Um, and next we have Katrin, and Katrin represents Medical Aid Films, uh, which um, many of you will know as a digital media organisation based in the UK, which has been at the forefront of of digital media content creation. Uh, particularly video content for health worker uh, content and patient education. And then finally, we have uh, our Irish representative at the end of the table, Linda, um, who comes from uh, the uh, creative manager is at the school in the box at the Institute of um, Art, Design and Technology uh, in, here in Dublin. And she's been involved uh, throughout her career in, in, in the area of digital media content creation. So um, what I'd like to do is call on our individual panel members just to tell us a little bit about who they are and what their work is and then we'll quite quickly get into the meat of the discussions about uh, the particular areas we'd like to focus on and, and really uh, get some hard outcomes from the discussions today. So I'd like to ask Ferdas a little bit about yourself and, and about your background and what brings you to Dublin. <laughs> <laughs> well you bring me to Dublin. Uh, thank you very much uh, Tom. Good morning ladies and gentlemen. And Tom, congratulations to you and Kunal for putting on what I think is turning out to be an excellent conference. We need more of these kinds of gatherings. So in terms of my background, let me just skip over that and tell you what I do. Uh, and that is I create media for social change. And that media can be broken down into various categories. I'm probably best known for creating animated shorts. These are very short, uh, very short animations, usually designed to be watched directly by a viewer whose behavior we're trying to change. So I've done various series on HIV AIDS prevention, malaria prevention. Today is World Diabetes Day. So I am currently working on a series that will be launched in uh, Arabic and English very soon on the rights of children with type one diabetes. If you might know, in the Middle East, they have the highest rate of diabetes in the world. Uh, and we are, I'm going to talk and come back to a little bit about something we worked on in collaboration with IHEAT and with United Methodist Communications, which is uh, I created a short video on Ebola prevention, which is now going around uh, West Africa. It's already on national television in several of the countries that have an, the Ebola crisis. I'll come to that in a minute. I also create long-form animation series, which are usually targeted at children. So I created the Middle East first Arabic uh, animated series for children and Africa's first animated series. 
And in both cases, we implanted numerous uh, health messages, everything depending on the age dependency, everything from the importance of washing your hands and hygiene to uh, more sophisticated messages. I create short videos uh, that are behavior change communications, probably the best known of which is on dementia uh, and caregivers who, uh, who uh, give assistance to people with various forms of dementia. Another one I'll mention, and picking up from what Alan said this morning on vitamin A, actually, Alan, it's not one cent, it's actually two cents, because my documentary on the vitamin A program is called Canada's Two Cents Worth, and it is on the, uh, it is on the vitamin A capsules uh, that, uh, that UNICEF and others uh, have delivered. Over a billion capsules have been delivered now to prevent blindness uh, and other, other problems, in, uh, particularly in Africa. And then finally, there are the long form, uh, various uh, series, television series, and, uh, and other kinds of series in which we, again, implant a large number of messages. And those can be up very long form, up to 800 episodes in soap operas. In, in Asia, I created the first English language daily soap opera in Asia, for example. So that's just a nutshell. Now let me come to Ebola as an example of uh, some substantive points rather than just what I do. First of all, I think Ebola was a good collaboration between AHID, United Methodist Communications as the producers, and me as the creative person creating this uh, short form, it's four minutes uh, 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 video on Ebola prevention. Secondly, I think it points to the lack of urgency that we deal with such subjects. I think that people have died in West Africa that we could have prevented. And I think that that has been the case in all kinds of histories on dealing with medical issues. The one of the, uh, one of the um, series that I'm best known for is called The Three Amigos, which is an HIV AIDS prevention program it now exists in 46 languages. We can reach about 80% of the world's population in their own language. It was launched about, I say, eight years ago at the World's Aid Conference in Bangkok. It was late. It was very late. And what we have done is we allowed people to get infected with easily preventable diseases. Uh, these diseases can be prevented if we have mass education programs, and I have stated publicly and reiterate that I think millions of Africans died of HIV AIDS that could have been prevented had we gotten them the information and public information on how HIV AIDS is transmitted and how to avoid getting HIV AIDS. The same situation is now repeated itself in Ebola. As Sweden's Medicine Sans Frontier, and they were the first to announce that there was a new Ebola crisis in West Africa, we should have leapt into action to inform West Africans on how this disease is transmitted and how to avoid getting Ebola. We didn't do that until very late. It's just, it's very recent that we've done that. And I think that West Africans uh, have paid with their lives for our inaction. So that's my provocative statement to get, this, uh, to get our discussion going. Thank you. Thanks, for, thanks for this. Um, so Uju. Um, would you tell us a bit about your work with One World? Yeah, hi. Um, I've been working with One World for the last seven years as, uh, and recently as a program director. What we do at One World is use um, digital media to address social causes, kind of like what everyone does who is on this panel does as well. We call it cross-media technology because it can be radio, it can be internet-based, web-based, and uh, mobile phone, and of course, increasingly, social media platforms. Today, I'm talking particularly, I'm going to concentrate on a sexual reproductive health program that is being implemented in six countries, and hopefully will be starting very soon in a seventh country in Asia. What we have done over the past few years is to work uh, in partnership with local organizations. We started in Nigeria in 2007. Um, we found that young people were not engaging with reproductive health information. Um, we were actually invited, again, driven by the late response to HIV. 
uh, the education sector had developed a curriculum for teaching HIV prevention in schools. Uh, this was a toned down version of a comprehensive sexuality education curriculum, but it was not being quite effective. Uh, so many reasons, I won't bother to go into that, but the key issue was that the content was not engaging enough for the young people. Uh, the teachers who were meant to be the primary caregivers or to pass this information to the young people had no knowledge, having not had any training on how to teach reproductive health or sexuality education. Uh, the social taboos around the country restrict free information about sex to young people. And so from our experience developing digital media content in uh, Asia earlier on around agriculture, in Kenya around unemployment, we were able to, from our experience, understand that we had to uh, look for opportunities to provide the content in a way that the young people would engage with it. And so that's how we got into this area of work. We took the curriculum, working with local stakeholders, and we designed um, an e-learning environment that we call interactive and dynamic with uh, Butterfly Works, an organization that's based out in Amsterdam, who are specialists in this type of work. But we made sure that we involved the stakeholders who would ultimately sustain this program. And of course, the primary ones were the Ministry of Education. It's not a very easy process, but we got organizations who were using the curriculum or trying to use the curriculum, or who had interest in making sure that youth were informed around sex and sexuality issues. And we, we built an online animation program, think soap opera, but delivered online um, using virtual cartoon characters. Uh, the concept of peer education is something which works very well in Africa, and so we use that, and we developed virtual peer educators that the young people could identify with. And we made sure that the lessons were delivered in youth-friendly language, and obviously we had to involve youth in the development of this um, <coughs> curriculum so that they would use it ultimately. But we also put a support service for teachers. Again, uh, we wanted to make sure that in the public sector where we found youth, most of the youth go to school, obviously to public schools. We wanted to make sure that the teachers who were charged with passing this information to the young people were also equipped. And so we created what we call the safe space through this e-learning environment uh, online. And because of the low resource setting of the country in most places, we had to develop an offline way of getting the project across to youth as well. And then uh, increasingly, mobile phones became very popular. Uh, we came into Nigeria a few years after the mobile phone was adopted, and we were able to make sure that this was mobile enabled as well. And we've seen this take off so much more in different countries. So for us, the content was local content. It was existing content. It just had to be delivered innovatively. It had also to create that safe space that young people needed to engage with these issues. And we had to provide them an avenue to ask follow-up questions. And so we partnered with one of the local organizations to provide them an SMS platform, connecting them to trained counselors that they could ask for the questions, and of course, if they needed referral services, uh, point them to where they could access youth-friendly services. And so it's a whole ecosystem of stakeholders that we kind to try to bring together to make sure that young people were empowered with information uh, that they would help them make positive decisions around their health. The other thing that we did um, after the initial two-year pilot, we were able to um, convince the funders to scale up uh, over another three years. And uh, as time went on, we picked the key lessons from that program, which is that we had to do a needs assessment before we launch any project. We had to work in multi-sectoral partnerships. We had to make sure that the content was um, locally uh, contextualized. And in Nigeria, this meant that we had to develop two different versions of the lessons, one for the north and one for the south. We were able to replicate and adapt in Senegal, in Mali, with the national governments. And everywhere we went, we did not um, 
create new content. We took existing content, we brought stakeholders together, and we made sure that they identified contents that would uh, that were uniform and they could use and continue their work in different situations. We did that because we wanted to ensure that sustainability was uh, a part of the process of the program. And we always had an exit plan for ourselves because the key was to, um, to transfer these skills, to build the capacity of the local organizations to continue to do the work. Uh, in some countries, it works in different ways. In, in Egypt and Morocco, the content is very much more digital. We use Facebook and social media um, more than we, we use SMS, uh, which is more popular in West Africa. Um, so the key points for me in how we work is that um, we don't recreate what already exists. And we try to bring people who would otherwise not work together to work together. Uh, developing digital content is not exactly cheap, but if we leverage resources and leverage what already exists, uh, sustainability would be a bit more achievable. Um, I'm sure there'll be more questions. Uh, let me yep. stop. And Thanks, Uju. Talk. That's been very informative. I think particularly that whole uh, aspect of involving uh, local people in content production and uh -huh. doing proper needs uh -huh. assessment at the beginning and uh, adopting that public-private partnership and collaboration uh, with all the stakeholders. And again, the point you make about the challenges of getting funding, uh, long pilots yeah. and long lead-in times to scaling up the programs, which Ferdas has clearly identified. Uh, are real challenges when you're in emergency situations. So, um, up to you, Catherine. Now, tell us a little bit about uh, Medical Aid Films okay, and your work thank you. there. Um, Thanks. Hi, everybody. It's great to be here. Thanks, Tom, very much. Um, just a little about a little bit about uh, the work I'm currently doing. I currently work for um, a small NGO called Medical Aid Films that produces innovative training films for low resource settings in the key area of maternal and child health. I'm fairly new in my role. I've been here a couple of months and my previous experience is with the BBC where I've been responsible for lots and lots of very big campaigns. And, and prior to my current job, uh, before that was with BBC Media Action, which is the BBC's international development charity where I ran an amazing project called BBC Janala um, in Bangladesh, which some of you might know. So at Medical Aid Films, we have around 34 films, and they cover kind of key topics such as breastfeeding, warning signs in pregnancy, how to care for a newborn, what to do if your child's sick. Uh, those films are translated into around 12 different languages. So that's a total of around 100 films altogether. We're focused entirely on skilled and community health workers, and we make films specifically for these target groups. Our content is free, it's open source, and it's available on our website, Vimeo, Facebook, YouTube, multiple platforms. It's also available on DVD, shown on projectors, laptops, and used in e-learning and training programs around the world. It's chunked up into various mobile projects and pilots that are ongoing. We want our content to be embedded wherever there is need, and we want it to be shared again and again. I guess that throughout my career, I've always been involved in developing media contact that uh, aims to make a difference, and whether that's been at the BBC, at BBC Learning, or at Media Action. And all of my work has involved developing a multi-platform approach that's taking content and putting it across platforms. And just to pick up on a kind of theme that I think has, has been part of the conference, partnership has been absolutely key to everything I've done in, in the media space. Uh, my own organization, Medical Aid Films, started around five years ago in a very, very small way. We just made one film, one simple and rather beautiful animation which covered the 10 steps to help a woman have a safe delivery. It's about four or five minutes long. But since then, the organization has responded to a huge demand, and we now receive requests for films every single day, which is astonishing. Our films are used by over 1,000 uh, 1, organizations worldwide in low resource settings, and our, our model is now entirely focused around building partnerships. 
Through partnerships, we can develop content that's absolutely tailored to need, and we can reach those who need it most. And partnerships enable us to develop content, evaluate it, and embed it into training. And that's very much where we see our future. Partnerships in a different way are also crucial to the development of our content. We bring together medical experts with filmmakers, animators, and editors, and exploring the challenge of turning quite complex medical information into engaging and compelling content which aims to build knowledge and challenge behavior. A, con a constant process of review, quality insurance and input. Essentially, our work is a creative process and it's, it's a fantastic thing to be involved in. But it can be both challenging but amazingly exciting as well. Great, uh, thanks very much. Um, very much appreciate that, and obviously many of us will be aware of uh, Sarah Chamberlain, your previous colleague, yeah. has, has been involved in many of these discussions with all of us before uh, in the work of BBC Media Action and Bihar. Um, so, uh, Linda, would you like to tell us a bit about your work? Yes, thank, thank you. you very much uh, for inviting me to be involved in this. I'm relatively new to this area. I work for um, the Institute of Art, Design and Technology in Dunleary, and I run a number of digital engagement projects there, both in Ireland and um, more recently in Mozambique and Nepal. Um, the project that I'm here to talk about today is School in a Box. Uh, School in a Box uh, is, uh, was designed for educational and learning environments uh, that where there isn't access to electricity. So it's a solar powered solution. It's a tablet device connected to a projector powered by a solar battery and solar panel. It's, um, it's mobile, it fits over uh, a person's shoulder um, and goes out into very remote communities and learning environments. Um, rather than um, mobile technology that involves one device per person, it is one device per group uh, using a projector. And our pr approach is very much a community engagement approach. Uh, we, very similar to Uju's uh, approach, we uh, do a needs assessment with uh, communities. We work collaboratively with communities. Um, we assume that the community is the expert in what their own needs are. Uh, they uh, drive the project from the perspective of what their needs are. And then we design training with them that enables the local community uh, leaders to uh, use the innate capacity of the digital technology, particularly the photographic capacity and video capacity, to create localized content specific to their local needs uh, and using local languages and environments where there's a proliferation of local languages. So that is the approach that we've used in our educational adult literacy contexts, um, uh, which usually incorporate health literacy into their programs. Um, but m very recently, we have also started collaborating with the Clinton Health Access Initiative in Mozambique at country level and with UCD Medical School, uh, where we've brought together uh, medical students with our um, animation and uh, visual design students, uh, two of whom were, Brazi were Brazilian, so uh, spoke Portuguese, which is... Uh, the uh, official language in uh, Mozambique, who work collaboratively together on a problem-solving approach to uh, the health literacy needs identified by the Clinton Health Access Initiative in their maternal health care clinics. Uh, similarly to Uju, we took an approach of uh, using, not reinventing the wheel, but using content that already existed. We've used quite a lot of content, really, really excellent films from medical aid films, uh, from UNICEF, from Pathfinder, um, localized when needed, uh, and then also using very simple content creation apps, such as whiteboard apps, uh, book creator, even keynote iMovie, uh, to create uh, a localized uh, approach that's, that's locally owned, locally driven. Uh, uh, we're very, very small. We're just starting in this space, so I have a huge amount to learn from, 
from all these people who are working on a much larger scale than us, but that's just the approach that we're taking with our project. Right. Th thanks, Linda. So I suppose the first question I'd like to throw out to the panel is, I mean, is, is there evidence? Does it work? I mean, the use of multimedia, does it work for us? Well, I have a mixed reaction to that question about this. In the final analysis, what I think I do is create art and not science. And if you ask any person in Hollywood, with all their brains and with all their money, they make $100 million movies that sometimes flop. There isn't anybody who can actually guarantee that their film or their animation is going to work. And anybody who pretends that they can guarantee it doesn't go into the creative process. It's a little bit, to me, like asking Van Gogh, Van Gogh in English, whether or not his painting is going to be appreciated by people. He actually only sold two paintings in his life. Now, having said that, there are times when we can evaluate them quite easily. Sometimes you can do them. I'll give you two examples. The three Migos was used extensively in South Africa, the HIV AIDS one at the beginning, almost at the beginning of the HIV crisis in South okay. Africa. And I was called to a meeting by Population Services International, I'll make this quick, where they told us that their sales of condoms, they're the world's largest social marketer of condoms, had gone up dramatically in South Africa. Now, we didn't have any empirical evidence to suggest that the start of the Three Amigos on national television was played up to 20 times a day on the South African Broadcasting Corporation, and we saturated the country with it for two years. There was no linkage, but it was, as they put it in the letter, it was reasonable to assume that there is a linkage between the, the three funny animated condoms going on television and the sales of condoms going up in South Africa, which led, led then to the reduction in the number of HIV AIDS, uh, 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 people getting HIV AIDS infections. Second example, in Madagascar, I created a series called Buzz and Bite uh, on malaria prevention. And in Madagascar, UNICEF first tested out one of the languages that we had done, the national language called Malagash, then they called me to Madagascar and he versioned them into all 15 other languages of Madagascar. So it became the only media ever created in all 16 languages of Madagascar. They played them all over the country in conjunction with the rollout that they were doing of the long-lasting insecticide-treated bed nets. And their goal is measurable. Their goal is to halve the number of children dying in Madagascar after 12 months because of malaria. Whether they will achieve it because of my program or their rollout of the bed nets or in combination of both, I don't know. But the goal is measurable. It's to have the number of children dying of malaria every, in 12 months. So sometimes you can measure them. And sometimes because the work I do reaches into households in millions of households, to the best of my knowledge, my work has been seen in over 150 countries by over 2 billion people, it is rather difficult to measure. And do you think it's, it's fair to tie funding to a specific metrics in, in terms of behavioral change communication? Or can that, you know, I'm being provocative now, but I mean, this, this is a conference all about evidence, isn't it, Bob? <laughs> well, I think that, sorry, but yeah, no, we I don't control want to keep answering. Others, yeah. But I, I think that the funders need to be flexible. Look, the Ebola video that we created with United Methodist funding and with AHI's collaboration costs all of $15,000. Now, perhaps we just prevented one infection, just one. It costs a heck of a lot more to treat one person of Ebola than $15,000. Just one infection is all we needed to achieve to be cost effective. So perhaps we save you know, 10 people from getting infected. That's very, very cost effective when you consider the cost. We have not placed enough emphasis on prevention. We're quite good at responding, you know, sending out doctors after the fact that people are dying. Okay, 
But if we worked on prevention, there wouldn't be such a need to spend billions of dollars sending the doctors to treat what's happening in these countries. Thanks for this. Uju, what are your thoughts? Um, Be honest. <laughs> <laughs> well, the truth is that if uh, funders would allow us to use the money that they want to use for evaluation, we would actually do a lot more, as in we, we could actually reach more people. Um, I once asked a funder uh, who wanted to put a cost, you know, cost per, per, per person reached. So I thought, why don't you do cost per human life? I'm not, you know, again, speaking about prevention. Sure. As for said, if you, if one young person listened, engaged with the content and took uh, preventive measures not to get, um, not to be infected with HCIs, HIV, cost of not treating that person. We hadn't ever think about it. Uh, in terms of evidence, I understand that we need evidence because we're people of science uh, mm. to prove that something works, but it takes time. And most times you get funding for a short pilot, two, three years. Um, we were able to get um, some data from Nigeria uh, over five years which was the longest that we had, um, the longest project that we've had. We have other projects that are still going on, and I'll, I'll be presenting this at the M Health Forum in DC. But the point is, uh, in terms of, I don't know what funders want, 50% of people who engage with this um, content change their behavior True. within how long. We did some baseline, yes, we had 14% who were more aware about gender, who were considered, because we had to develop indicators that would you know, be proxies for behavior or change or sure. change in knowledge and attitude. And so we were really pleased when um, we, in Nigeria, 14% reported increase in knowledge around gender issues. That was great, 22% around HIV, great. You can measure, would you use a condom next time? Sure. You know, those are things that are easy to measure, but. What about the person who incidentally not come in contact with the project and perhaps it'll be a case that sure. um, you have to start treating yeah. AIDS, you know? So that's a really difficult question no. to answer. Th thanks, Catherine, and your thoughts? Um, yeah, I was just gonna add to that really and just say sure. I, I think that film and media can be an incredibly powerful tool uh, in making a difference in people's lives not just um, in inspiring, but building confidence, building knowledge, showing best practice, a whole range of things. But lots of those things are very, very difficult to measure, particularly if you're, 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 you're mass media and you're, trying, you're reaching people in their millions at home. Um, and I also agree, measurement is, is really expensive. I, I mean, I think we do it in our, our small way. We have our, our, you know, our reach figures across our platforms and we do qualitative research when we can to get feedback. So we do, we do try and measure and that, that the measurement and the feedback is incredibly important in enabling us to develop better content moving forward. So it's an important part of that process. Yeah. And do you think there's a natural reticence from the funding side to fund um, multimedia? To fund multimedia or yeah, in general, as part of programs rather mm. than yeah, know. it tends to be seen, I think, as a bit of an add-on. Okay. Rather, you know, okay, you're doing this and add on a quick film, <laughs> something like that, rather more than a kind of central part of something that can really be, okay. really make a difference. Do you want to add to that for us? Sorry. Well, yeah. Thanks, Kat. Let, let me just keep adding to the provocative <laughs> statements I'm making, <laughs> by saying that health professionals have not come to terms yet with the reality of today's world. The reality Steady on is now. that for the first time, we are in the age of two-way communications. That is a new moment in history. Never before have we had the capacity in human history to reach virtually every person on this planet and to have them interact back with us. And health professionals have now only started to realize that perhaps there's an opportunity here to revolutionize health, but we're still a long way from recognition of the capacity. I, I take as an example the uh, title, that, the question that we were given on this panel. And public health programming without super saturating the health worker. 
Well, we're a long way, <laughs> a long way from saturating, let alone super saturating the health worker with media programs. No, and, and just to add to that, I mean, that a particular question came from the funding side, from one of the funders uh, who, who really wanted the evidence about, you know, are we going to super saturate uh, community health workers with uh, content if we're messaging them, if we're sending them uh, content, be it PDFs, be it text, be it um, uh, multimedia uh, content, was there a risk that they'd be getting over messaged and super saturated with content? So I, I'm in your camp. Uh, sorry, Catherine, yeah. To, to add there, I do think we tend to work in isolation a bit sure. and that we don't necessarily always know what each other is doing. Um, and around the Ebola, uh, you were talking about we did a whole troll, troll of what was happening, decided not to because we saw other things sure. that were going on. So I, I do think there's a need for kind of more communication, more, more information about what we're all doing, sharing it more, really. Be sure, and obviously forums like this allow that opportunity. Yeah. Linda, your thoughts on the yeah. evidence side? On the evidence, yeah, I, I do believe it is quite difficult, particularly if you're working at the level you're working at, but we're working on a smaller sure. level, and uh, we, we are putting in place uh, mechanisms to gather evidence. We're at, we're at an early stage of that, but we do believe that it's important, even on a very small scale, to show impact. Um, so uh, on a knowledge and skills basis, we will uh, collect evidence, but also uh, we will try to look at behavioral change. Yeah, Difficult I, though I, it is. Absolutely, and I think when we, we hear the talk of um, you know, pilots that go on for two years, I think Reza's uh, suggestion yesterday of you know, it's phase one of the project, yeah. you know, mm. we need to move away from, you know, we had a long discussion and, and many arguments about pilots or no pilots. Uh, but I think this has been a, a bugbear, hasn't it? Um, you know, to prove evidence, uh, how much evidence do we really need? So I, it's good to have this discussion. So in terms of um, partnerships, because there's been a big um, focus on partnerships here at the, at the conference and last week at the Irish Forum for Global Health as well, um, what's an ideal partnership for, for all of you? And maybe we'd start at the other end, Linda, just to mix it up. Um, well, I suppose... Um the philosophy of um, IADT in Dunleary is very much about um, collaboration and bringing together different skill sets. And, and we use that educationally where we throw psychology students and animation students together and see what happens. And um, we use that approach in, in this project as well. So uh, I think bringing together uh, unexpected skill sets sure. and seeing, seeing what creativity can come out of that can be very enriching. But always, um, I suppose, uh, listening uh, and being open to unexpected um, needs uh, and also obstacles because uh, sometimes we go into a project with the attitude that we know what's required or needed and often very surprising uh, obstacles uh, come uh, that we wouldn't have expected. So it's really about listening and bringing together different stakeholders and partners uh, to listen together. And the role of the husband came up earlier. Uh, it, it, that turned out to be uh, something in the maternal healthcare clinics with the Clinton uh, Health Access are running, uh, saying that the role of the husband and the mother-in-law uh, and how whatever health literacy activities that you are running to creatively think about how that can can uh, be reached out into the community. So it's about all stakeholders, mm. even the unexpected ones, yeah, and, and the I ones that you don't immediately think of. Totally, and I agree with you completely about uh, cross-sectoral involvement. Mm. Um, you know, uh, Ferdas and I have been down to MIPCOM, where you've got, you know, I don't know, 50,000 multimedia content experts at Ottawa Animation Festival, mm. at Annecy Animation Festival, and there's a whole creative industry out there that has a whole different set of skill sets uh, which can be brought to the table. So, I mean, uh, Catherine, your thoughts? Um, I think there are many different kinds of partnerships. And, and for us, the, the small ones, you know, a hospital in Somaliland that's using our films to, in training of midwives can be just a, a, a kind of incredible partnership for us because our content is so embedded into those training programs and used every single day. So that's one kind. I mean, big global partners are really important for us because they help us 
get the content, distribute it uh, to and, and widen the reach. And then um, partners like um, the Digital, Digital Campus uh, mobile project where our content is being chunked up uh, in, into that project and put onto mobile. That's another kind of partnership. But I mean, just a wide variety, really. It's, mm. it's, it's hard to categorize. Yeah. They're all different. Thanks. You do? Well, um, for me, <coughs> the issue of partnerships, as everyone says, is really different. But um, I've been attending M Health conferences for quite a while, and I keep hearing this issue about partnerships and collaborations. And I don't really see it working. Maybe it works for the bigger global partners. Uh, it doesn't work for the smaller NGOs. We work in um, limited funding, low resource settings. We are mostly catalysts. We see ourselves as catalysts. We want to, with the local stakeholders, identify how technology can add value to the work that they're doing. So we don't want to replicate what they're doing. We just want to add value, yep. uh, help them reach more people, harness you know the the opportunities that technology provides and so um if we bring together these stakeholders as i said earlier how we work we don't um we went into senegal for instance in 2009 and we found that there were like 13 curriculum mm. you know trying being used in schools to reach adolescents how does that work? You know, sure. WHO supports one population council, all of them have all been developed and the contents are quite similar. So what we often tend to do is bring the stakeholders together, bring the government in as well, because we understand that they're policy makers and they're the ones who are crucial to the sustainability of the program and for their acceptability in schools, mm. which is also crucial. And so we, we, we fund a six month session of just put together a curriculum that you can all adopt and use. And we put this out there and we get them to try and advocate that the government approves this and it gets to be used in schools. And, um, and um, say USAID funds another organization, they come into town and they do the whole process all over again. And one of the things we're trying to say is, but it exists, find the gaps. Sure. Say in Senegal, we finally got this organization who got money from USAID and they wanted to start everything again. And we said, no, we can't. We already got money from the Dutch government. We've produced this. Who do you want to reach? What is in this curriculum that all the stakeholders have come together to produce that isn't there? Okay, we want to reach MSM, fine. We find experts, that's your specialty, add on to it, and people can use it. And so for me, partnerships until the, I love them, I don't know them, USAIDs and the DFIDs <laughs> begin to encourage this a little more, you know. It'll, continue to be a rhetoric. I know some things are happening up there in America globally, but that's fine. Last week, I'm off to Cambodia next week where we recently launched the same project, and another organization has been funded, uh, sub-funding from another big organization, I don't want to keep calling them. Um, we've had a meeting with them, the government called them together and said, well, One World and the partners have developed this, why don't you work with them? At the end of the meeting, they're like, oh, that's fine, but we want our one. You know, so sure. the partnerships, it differs, but again, I question this call for partnerships yep. if we're not really getting to see it done. Yeah, I think two of the big challenges with partnerships is everyone will partner with you as long as they have the money. Um, you know, and, 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 and I think the second thing is that a lot of the donors, and there are quite a number of them in the room, is that they're very large organizations and you can get fantastic traction with uh, individuals and there are some wonderful people innovating within those organizations. But to get that uh, to the leadership um, and to get the decision making at that higher level and get that buy-in, because often they take one particular direction with the organization. So it is frustrating, but I suppose it beholds all of us to, to hold our temper and <laughs> get on with the work. So Ferdas, do you want to add to that? So, <laughs> it's very unusual to have Ferdas silent. <laughs> so uh, maybe if we, Peter, would you like to make a comment on, from Global Health Media Project uh, from your side? Uh, let's see. Uh, well, I was the sure. Just from um, perhaps to focus on your experience on you know the funding side or access to funds or the evidence. Yeah, maybe I'll make a few comments sure. about evidence, and I think I'd probably uh, 
echo uh, Catherine's comments, I think, about the importance of, of narrative and kind of feedback from the field. Because one thing we experience is, um, like medical aid films, Global Health Media Project videos are used in most countries of the world. And so we've often had the uh, sense that you could do um, um, evaluation at a, a local level in any particular place. And the, no matter how successful you were, the immediate question you'd get next is, well, does that mean it works in another country or somewhere else? Sure. Whereas the narrative can circumvent that because you can actually ask people in Cambodia or Ghana or Nicaragua how it works and compare the responses and questions and actually do it quite effectively, not, not as rigorously or quantitatively, but I think you can get feedback that's quite important that way. Another thing we experience is, um, you know, we make videos that are really complementary training tools. And so um, part of the question, I guess, is where's the burden of proof in terms of whether or not these are really effective? So uh, we have um, many training organizations, uh, and many of the big ones from WHO, Save the Children in Chicago, using our films in many different regions of the world. Um, and so when you look at that, they pre-select in many ways and decide to use the films because they believe they're good and important in training. So I think uh, it's a little bit different than when you're going to the final consumer, I believe, where you say, is it working or not? Well, someone has to be able to maybe show that. Uh, in our case, I think um, the training organizations are selecting the films because, and, and they're often then doing their own evaluation, is our training program effective? And is video an important piece of the training we're actually doing? So I think it helps that way as well, so. Yeah. Thanks, Peter, for yep. those comments. Anybody else like to comment? Well, uh, Tasman here at the front, you have extensive experience in content production also. Hi, I'm Tamsin Simons, son. Can you hear me? Oh, yes, nice. Very clearly. OK. <laughs> um, yeah, I also wanted to address the question of, you know, do the films make a difference? How can we measure that? And I agree, evaluation is very difficult. I think Ferdo said he wanted to provoke us, and he certainly provoked me. <laughs> um, just with the sense, perhaps because uh, of the material I work with, but um, when I'm making videos or other materials, I'm not looking at myself. As much as I want them to be beautiful and works of art unto me, I'm not seeing them first and foremost as works of art, which may or may not make a difference. That would be a nice add-on. For me, I feel like I have a big responsibility to do whatever I can before I put out that material and disseminate it. I have to try and establish whether it's going to be as good as I can make it, or as, in as much as I can sense that before I put it out. Especially because a lot of the stuff that we work with goes to NGOs who are desperate for materials, who will take whatever they can get because nothing else exists. So if I say to them, you know, in the case of the work I spoke about yesterday with TB instructional materials, if they have nothing else to use and they've got hundreds, thousands of patients who have TB, um, and I say, I've got this video here to teach patients how to get tested for TB, they're assuming that it's been vetted in some way. They're assuming that if I'm making it available to them in their language, I've done my best to make sure that this is going to actually be useful. It is beautiful, I think it's beautiful, but um, you know, I think I have a responsibility to them to produce the best I can before I hand it over because they're gonna take whatever I give them and they're going to use it, whether it's effective or not, and they're just going to, you know, and if it's not improving things, they're not going to even know perhaps that it's the materials that could be improved. So. Do you want to respond? I just want to add something. The biggest funders in my work are, anybody want to guess? The broadcasters. They donate millions of dollars to air my work. And the people who program those television stations, for example, in the Ebola videos currently playing in Liberia, I'm not paying, we're not paying collectively, I he, yeah, Methodist Church or me, are not paying to place that on television in Liberia. The programmer who is placing his airtime at our disposal for free is the person who's on the ground who knows their own audience. And they're the people who are doing the evaluation of the myriad of media that they get and therefore decide which one that they're going to air with free airtime. So there's a lot of evaluation that does go on. 
but by a myriad of different people who use the material. Yeah, and I think Tamsin's point is, is very fair. Above all, do no harm. I mean, you know, that is imperative for all of us. Sorry. Sorry. So I wanted to flip it and ask you uh, about all the violent media we see. So we can call it art if you want, but mm. the impact on children and our brain and sure. on our health is horrible. So I think just because we assume what we're doing um, is good, we're helping health workers, we have to be very careful about mm. doing no harm. So to sure. reiterate that. Sure. Yeah. Neely? The Ebola video was the first of its kind that United Methodist Communications had funded. And so we come from this um, sense of we have to have metrics. We have to see exactly where all of our pieces are going. And that is how we know that something is successful or not. So this was a new experience for us because when you create something that's a Creative Commons license and you put it out there on Vimeo and it's there for download, all you can really track is the number of downloads. And you have to be satisfied with that. You have to learn to be satisfied with that, I should say, because then each one of those downloads takes on a life of its own. And so we've ended up with people coming to us and saying where it's being seen. In the first week, um, in the first, yeah, within the first couple of days, we had someone write to us from Guinea. And he said, I need this in the local dialects. And so we said, well, if you'll work with us, Ferdos can produce those. So um, in a matter of days, we had three new translations, three new voiceovers from local people submitted to us with MP3 files. Then Ferdos was able to recreate it in those new translations. So it's become this viral entity in the best sense of the word, bringing together people from around the world to focus on saving lives. And for this, it's been an amazing learning experience for us as a donor and contributor and executive producer. Thank you. Uh, on the Ebola video, we have now 12 versions. We started with just one. And one of those versions has over half a million embeds. Not views, embeds. That means that people have taken it and put it onto their own websites or used it in different versions. Um, a cowboy at the front. <laughs> so I think there, there may be a disconnect between claim and assessment. And I think everything we're saying is, is correct. It's just where do we have the evidence to make a certain claim. So, so just the, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation has a really elegant sort of series of metrics that they suggest for benchmarking health communication materials. They ask, you know, track the number of materials distributed, learn about the reactions to the materials, assess changes in attitudes and knowledge, and assess changes in behavior. That last one is possibly the hardest mm -hmm. to measure, but yet that's the one that we all want to make claims about. Sure. So I think where, where the, the tension lies is when we make claims about the last one with evidence from the first two. That we have a lot of downloads and we've got a lot of distribution and therefore we're saving lives. And I know it's a, it's a, it's a necessary evil that, that we have to sort of uh, undertake to, to motivate the funding community. But I think there are ways in which we can measure the last two. They're difficult and they're expensive. but that's where we, we, we should be heading if, if in, in fact, we want to answer those last questions. The, the concern of attribution is tremendous because populations are getting healthier and, and health metrics are improving globally across the board. Uh, maternal mortality has dropped three, four, five fold globally without our ability to say what specifically has caused that reduction, right? Yeah. So, so that's the, the elusive challenge that we have to always ask ourselves, do, is our claim commensurate with the data that we've generated? And if not, then perhaps we can find out ways to do that. Um, it's not impossible, but it's difficult. Yeah. 
Sorry, at the very back, I, I'm totally in agreement with you, Elaine, and you put it so eloquently as you always do. Yeah. Hi, thanks uh, so much. Um, thanks so much. I wanted to just kind of switch gears to a somewhat tangentially related topic, which is um, yeah. talking about localization versus scale up. And I know most of the panelists, first of all, thank you so much. I was nodding my head in every single thing that you all said, so I appreciate all of your perspectives. Um, but all of you are kind of working in larger, seemingly scaled up mass media projects. And so coming from the Spring Digital Green perspective that I presented yesterday, which is a really hyper-local approach, um, we found that in order to look at that behavior change, um, the videos needed to be really localized and contextualized. And so I'm curious from your perspectives, what, you know, what is the, the happy medium between localization and then being able to scale it up on a um, larger scale? Um, either district by district, by national scale. Um, how do you keep that localization so it's relevant to the people that you're talking to while still being able to scale it up um, and make it more cost effective as well? Uju, do you want to answer that? Uh, yeah, <coughs> thanks. We don't work in really big settings. We, we actually start very small. Um, we, we've encountered that in every, everywhere where we've worked. There's no one size fits all. And so we always make sure that we have as, many, as much representation from different stakeholders as possible, realizing that we are, we're going to eventually scale it up across the country. So um, it hasn't been easy. Um, in um, Nigeria, we had to develop two versions and uh, that was to get it accepted in the predominantly North Muslim uh, part of the country. And that involved making a lot of changes, even language, uh, animation, characters, heads had to be covered. Even uh, the tool for teachers, because we had to develop a DVD for teachers, how to train. We had to change all of that to make it acceptable. The tools were there, they just weren't being used. So when we did the evaluation, we wanted to find out why wasn't it being used in one part of the country. And this was part of the feedback that we got. So constantly engaging with the stakeholders. And we don't implement ourselves. Um, we work through NGOs. And so we often have to keep track. We have materials that we use to monitor. And when we get this, we want to know why. And we're easily adaptable, but the, these animations and these platforms that we build, it's done in such a way that um, we use local people also, so that if changes need to be done, it can be done cost effectively and it can be done quickly. Uh, the other thing also is, uh, what we say is that we adapt, we replicate as we scale up. Again, we found that in Senegal, we found that in Mali as well, even using local language, where things are pronounced differently we can't use our materials in Morocco in Egypt, even though they're all Arabic speaking, because Arabic, Moroccan Arabic is different from Egyptian Arabic. So if, in all of this context, I mean, localization is very key to us, uh, and it has to be. I don't know if I've responded you to your to question. Do you want to add to that, Catherine? Yeah. Sorry. a really small <coughs> quick point. Um, I, excuse me, <coughs> I'm using my voice. Um, I'm really fascinated by the work you talked about yesterday, and um, I know the work that Digital Green does really well, and I think they're amazing. And I do think there's something interest, interesting in a kind of complementary. I think our work and that work can be quite complementary, really. Um, plus also to say that our, our kind of assets for our films are available for anybody to use and to create their own content locally. So for instance, our animations and our scripts are all available separately so that people can take them and, and, and build content themselves around them. It's not as good as what you're doing, but it's, it's, a, it's a step in that, that direction. Very good. Uh, Robert Karen Duff, do you want to add anything from your perspective on patient education content, the evidence? Or Oh, sorry, I didn't see it. Sorry. Uh, as far as um, localizing for different languages, etc., or reusing the content, um, it's something we talked about last year. And uh, in fact, all of you have mentioned the idea that all these different organizations and all these different charities are creating content or dealing with needs in specific areas. 
I, I think what when we spoke last year about the idea of a, a portal where this all comes together, a sort of medical YouTube, where uh, stakeholders interested in getting uh, content can input to that, and people who have content can input. Uh, and it doesn't have to be localized. I mean, I've rarely ever uh, learned something from something that's been localized directly from me. Uh, if you leverage the content you create somewhere else, then someone else can uh, localize into a different language they need to. Uh, but that central portal, that sort of YouTube of content, would be something that we're all reading, uh, hoping it would exist or someone take over. Not a, not a, not a charity, because then it'll become uh, a partisan slightly. I mean, uh, that's not probably the correct term, but a commercial entity that created this medical uh, uh, YouTube or this medical uh, uh, content database that they were using from uh, first world countries for everyone else. That makes sense. Sure. Thanks, Robert. Um, and there are a number of initiatives there. Leslie Ann and Empowering. They have content library. There are a number of content libraries uh, and initiatives in existence. Sorry, the person who I was overlooking who wanted to ask a question. Sorry. Uh, thank you. Um, very interesting discussion. And I think, um, in terms of and 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 great work in in terms of behavior change, communication, and getting these videos out there. I think one of the pieces that's missing from this conversation is the actual clinical services that we're drawing clients to in terms of partnerships and research. Um, if we're looking at outcomes, you know, what are we driving behavior change for? A uptake of family planning or HIV services? And so in terms of partnerships, thinking about the clinical implementers as well, and are we driving clients to services that are of quality? Or how are we engaging those, those um, stakeholders in the conversation? Was, Great. So, question to them. thank you very much. So, so just to, on on your behalf, I'd like to thank the panel for their 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 honesty and openness. And I think we had a very good and frank discussion, and and everybody added to that. For me, the the big issue is 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 that balance between the hard evidence and do no harm at all costs that Tamsin uh, described so well, versus uh, Ferdows's Picasso and. Uh, you know, it's the, that tension, and, 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 and this conference and Get Health Summit is all about the evidence. So, uh, and I think Elaine described very well at the end there, you know, that multi layered approach uh, to the evidence and the use of, of, of multimedia. So, uh, on that, we'll break for coffee. Um, we thank you all for your attention, and I'd like you to uh, show your appreciation for the panel. Thank you.